I continue to benefit from all the things I've uh, uh, learned and continue to learn from the people that have uh, graced the Yale Divinity School. Uh, and uh, it's uh, just uh, wonderful to be able to come back from uh, uh, time to time. I should say, I, I, uh, it's n I was not named by time America's best theologian. I was named the best theologian in America. So the Hazessi doesn't get me. The, um, um, I was, I was, uh, <laughs> I, um, I mean, these are important matters. You gotta, you gotta say what you can. I, uh, uh, I was, I was in Ireland, uh, a summer ago with Enda McDonough, and, uh, um, it is, many of you know, as moral, the retired now moral theologian of Maynooth, and the pedophilia crisis had hit Ireland about 15 years ago, and, I said uh, to Enda, I said, do you think uh, there's any chance that this might um, uh, teach the church some humility? And um, Enda said, possibly no humility without humiliation. That's the way I think about Time Magazine. I mean, <laughs> they find a way to humiliate you. Uh, now, I'm going to talk, make, I hope, not more than 30 minutes because I take it that uh, uh, the questions and answers are more... Uh, of what the day should be about. I was asked, how do you, as a theologian, engage and shape public conversation with the resources of faith, thinking, thinking through both the possibilities and the obstacles? I don't have the slightest idea. Um, I never ask myself that kind of question. just never comes up. Um, uh, I simply do what I do as energetically as I can and I do what I do unapologetically. Um, uh, this is how I think, and if you don't like it, you can go to hell. That's just the way I do it. Uh, 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 now that said, I'm quite aware that what seems to be my not notoriety is ironic. As the official representative of the pediatric sectarian tribe, I'm not supposed to be intelligible in modernity. <laughs> then how do you explain, people ask me, how it happens that you are asked to write about evil in Time magazine, for example, uh, which would just contingency. Uh, uh, and I think the answer is very simple about that. Uh, mainly, I have something to say. I get asked because I have something to say. And uh, that I have something to say has almost nothing to do with me. Uh, I only have something to say because the stuff I, I, I steal from the church, that's why I have something to say. I just take Christian speech straight up and then try to uh, use it in an unapologetic way uh, in, a, in the hopes it will do some work. So I seldom confirm what Christians and non-Christians alike think what Christians should say about X or Y. But I try to let the Christian convictions that possess my life force me to reframe how I think we need to think and live if we are to be faithful. I do not try to be original or provocative. Indeed, I hate that word provocative. I get introduced all the time that you're going to, you're, you will find what he will say is provocative. That's just liberal speech. That's the way uh, people get to say, I, I understand what you're saying, and I will consider part of it, but of course most of it is wrong. So the idea is you can always step back from wherever you are. Uh, so I, I mean, uh, I just hate to be provocative. Uh, I'm, I, I would rather be morally outrageous than provocative. I mean, that would be a step in the right direction. Um, I just try to say what the gospel should do to our imaginations. Um, in that regard, I, I think one of the fundamental aspects of what I try to do is I'm an enemy of sentimentality because I regard sentimentality as the deepest um, uh, uh, threat to Christianity in modernity. If only we could produce interesting atheists, 
But, of course, since we're not interesting believers, we no longer are able to produce interesting unbelievers. But we do produce a sentimental form of Christianity that seems to me to always lead to the erosion of Christian speech. Sentimentality such as the assumption that we want to have and raise children without our children suffering for our convictions. That's sentimentality. That's sentimentality. And uh, that's why uh, it becomes um, very important um, to uh, help Christian speech escape from the sentimentalities that people um, uh, assume are the necessary ways to uh, traverse uh, this society in which we find ourselves. So let me try to give just some examples for how I try to uh, work. Uh, for example, during the Clinton debate in his first term about gays in the military, <clears throat> I came up with the idea uh, in a, a little short essay called My Gays as a Group Are Morally Superior to Christians as a Group. And I say, what a wonderful thing that the gays were able to do. They got themselves banned from the military as a group. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, why couldn't that happen to Christians? Um, you know, I mean, um, um, you know, I, at least, I mean, I'm a pacifist, but I, you know, Christians are at least supposed to be just warriors. Have to worry about where you're going to bomb. You know, oh no, can't, can't, uh, can't bomb Fallujah, you know, you're going to get civilians and so on. Or uh, Christians always think they ought to tell the truth, even to their enemies. I mean, do you want them in the military? And um, uh, they, uh, they even think they ought to pray for their enemies. I mean, is this good for um, a truth morale? Or every night there's that group over there in the barracks with their heads bowed, holding hands. Who knows what kind of disgusting activity they're into? Or would you want to shower with them? They're evangelistic, baptizing sect. You never know when they're going to try to lay it on you. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so, I mean, why can't Christians get themselves banned from the military as a group? Uh, uh, so, uh, by writing a little piece like that, I try to help Christians see that the debate about gays betrays the material conditions that capture our lives and make us less than Christian. Uh, so it's, the article, obviously, is not really an article about gays, except it tried to show that Christians were, uh, it tried to show if Christians were suspected by the military, the argument about gays in the church would be quite different. If, as a matter of fact, if Christians could get themselves banned from the military as a group, would gay people want to be a member of that group? Gay people have enough problems in this society. If I join up with another banned group, uh, if Christians could get themselves banned from the military as a group. Uh, and also, of course, it, and then how would that change arguments about sex? Is sexual fulfillment all that interesting when you're part of a body of people who have got themselves banned from the military as a group? What kinds of disciplines do you need to survive as a people who have got themselves banned from the military as a group. Now, uh, and this one of the things, therefore, I, I try to do is to uh, find the cracks in our convictions that are not oftentimes articulate and to try to make them articulate in a way that seems unavoidable. I learned from Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, who many of you know, this, I, a, a few years ago, uh, Bill Kavanaugh called me up and said uh, uh, he and Peter Scott were uh, uh, editing the Blackwell Companion on Political Theology and he said, we want you to do Reinhold Niebuhr. I said, no way. If I pack Reinhold Niebuhr one more time, people think I got a fetish. Um, <laughs> I said, who you got left? He said, Bonhoeffer. I said, I'll take him. So um, <laughs> that was, a, that was a, a good thing. Um, 
but what I did learn from my own neighbor, I think my own neighbor, the power of his work has so much to do with his insights and with the wonderful way he wrote his insights. And people oftentimes confused his insights with the position, and they thought they had to agree with the position because they wanted the insight. Now, I hope I write from time to time insightfully, and that you can't have my insights without the arguments I'm making about the gospel, because I want to try to show that they can only be produced. I mean, if you had, if I hadn't have been shaped by John Howard Yoder, I would have never known how to ask the question, why gays as a group are morally superior to Christians as a group. So you see how the intellectual work you do changes the very way that you present issues in a way that takes people off guard without protection, so that you can get the theological, you can get the theological language to start doing some work for you. Another article like that that I want to talk about is the article, Should We Prevent Retardation?, which is a thought experiment that, because I was associated with the Association of Mentally Handicapped in South Bend, the Association of Retarded Citizens had developed this movie to show this couple looking out across the crib, and the room is very dark, and they look up at you and say, don't let this happen to you. Our lives are ruined. We did not have good prenatal care, and our child was born mentally handicapped. Our lives are ruined. Don't let this happen to you. Now, that struck me as, I mean, they were doing it because the Association of Retarded Citizens gets the rear end of the federal dollar when it comes to disabilities and the research. And so they were trying to tap into, we need to cure cancer kind of thing. But then, I mean, you can care for a cancer patient and treat their cancer without eliminating the patient. You can't cure mentally handicapped without eliminating the patient. So by discovering opportunities like that, it begins to help you see, then, what are the preconditions for thinking that we should not subject our lives to the project of eliminating the mentally handicapped. So I always try to find those kinds of entries to how to think about theological discourse in a way that it's always prevented from becoming theory. I'm the great enemy of theory. So I want always to find the concrete place in which you can help see how theological discourse as a practice is making a difference. Now, what this example, such as why gays as a group are morally superior to Christians as a group, what this example shows is also, however, I write primarily for Christians, or at least people who say they are or want to be Christian. I include myself primarily in the latter category, want to be Christian, which means audience is really important. So I always try to think about the audience to whom I'm writing. I also learned this from John Yoder. If you'll notice, John Yoder never started an essay without my assignment is. And so he always was very specific about what he was charged to do. I think audience is very important, and I think the agony of the contemporary university is shown in the very idea that some academics ought to become public intellectuals. That's about the last thing I think I would want to be or that I would want theologians to be. Because I think the very idea of public intellectual is but a commentary on the pathos of the modern university. That is, there no longer exists a literary public 
that provides the possibility for people not in the university to think that what is happening in the university to be important to their lives. So the very fact that there is now such a disconnect between what we be, what we do in the university and what is known as the learned public. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking of Raymond Williams coal miners that read Shakespeare in the mines in Wales. <laughs> Um, uh, and they thought it mattered that somebody was rightly thinking about uh, Shakespeare. Um, 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 we now need to have public intellectuals because we no longer have a public. <laughs> we now need to have public intellectuals because we no longer have a public. And that is the reason why the primary legitimation of the university today depends upon science. That is not because the science is understood by any learned public, but because science is, because science is pro promised power. And in particular, science promised power to, to help people uh, uh, fulfill their desire to get out of life alive. Uh, and that's the reason why, uh, the, uh, you know, I, I oftentimes um, uh, ask people uh, how they want to die. Everyone in our society wants to die quickly, painlessly, um, in their sleep, and without being a burden. Um, I think that you can decide to agree or disagree with that. And I oftentimes point out that, of course, that that is exactly opposite to how medieval people wanted to die. And even through the book of Common Prayer to this day, there is a prayer that says, save, save me from a sudden death. And the reason that, of course, in the Middle Ages and in the Book of Common Prayer, we pray to save ourselves from a sudden death, was at one time Christians feared God, not death. <laughs> so they wanted a lingering death where they got to um, reconcile themselves with their enemies, that is, their family, um, <laughs> the church, and God. Um, 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 now, now, we expect physicians to keep us alive to the point that when we die, we don't have to know we're dying, and then we get to blame physicians for keeping us alive to no point. Uh, this is a wonderful double bind game, and that um, the, the modern university is very much taken up in that game, of uh, um, uh, giving us some idea that science somehow is going to serve us, and that has everything, and, and therefore it's going to make us. Um, um, we don't know what the science is, we just know what its promise and power is. And that has everything to do with why medical schools today are so much more morally interesting than divinity schools. I mean, the people come to divinity schools, and I know we, we try not to have this happen. People come to divinity schools, and, and oftentimes, I mean, Yale and Duke both have a very young student body, but as you know, in most divinity schools today, people that are there have already failed in another line of work before they get there. <laughs> and, uh, um, um, the, which, which, is, uh, which is good, because, I mean, after all, Christianity is basically about failure. And, um, um, and uh, but, you know, uh, someone can come to the divinity school and say, gee, I'm just not really into Christology this year. I'm really into relating. <laughs> we say, right, um, uh, CPE, wounded eater, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, <laughs> um, a, kid, a kid can come to medical school and say, you know, I'm just really not into anatomy this year. I'm really into relating. I'd like to take some more psychiatry, therefore showing they don't know a gift about psychiatry since it's all biochemistry. But they, um, uh, uh, and they say, well, who in the hell are you, kid? We're not interested in what you're interested in. Take a, take anatomy or ship out. Now, what, what accounts for the fact that, um, that medical schools today are so much more interesting schools of moral formation than divinity schools? I think the answer is very simple. No one believes that an anatomically trained priest may damage their salvation, but people do believe an anatomically trained doctor can hurt them. And just to the extent that that attitude pervades all of us, you understand why most of us live lives of quiet, desperate atheists. And um, so the university serves, I think, um, medicine. 
as its legitimating activity to give it power. And of course, this, had, this puts the humanities in a peculiar bind. I mean, I think one of the uh, issues in the modern universe is um, um, where none of us are quite sure what the humanities are about, nor do we know who we write for. Who do we write for in the humanities? Um, 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 and of course, one of the results of this is that we write primarily for one another, which, mean, which means our prose is determined more and more by jargon. And if you don't believe that, just read any post-Marxist from Duke who uh, clearly showed that they could not write a sentence in which the proletariat would have the slightest idea of what the hell is going on. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I, I mean, so um, uh, uh, Marxism has become an elitist culture. And indeed, one of my um, one of my very close friends is Stanley Fish. And when uh, uh, when Stanley was um, uh, considering um, uh, becoming dean of the University of Illinois Chicago, uh, everyone at Duke said, "Nah, Stanley won't do that. It's not prestigious enough." I said, "Oh, the hell with that. Uh, uh, Stanley um, uh, um, doesn't need prestige. He just wants to do some good before he dies. I'll bet he do it." And so um, I told that to Stanley, and he said, don't you tell anyone. And, uh, but <laughs> uh, but I, I said to him, I said, Stanley, I said, why in the hell do you want to go off to be a dean? I mean, a position in which people have to regard you, but you don't have to regard them. I said, it's just, I said, it's just the agony of influence. So you write another brilliant book on Milton, who gives a shit? Um, uh, uh, so uh, by being a dean at the University of Illinois Chicago, you think somehow or the other um, uh, that you'll be able, um, you know, to make a difference in the world. And Stanley said, all that's true, but it delays narcissism five years. <laughs> I, they, um, uh, uh, I, uh, and I think that that's one of the things that's happened to the humanities. It's become a narcissistic uh, endeavor in which we have lost an audience to who we write to other than one another, which helps uh, understand why public intellectuals now have to become a role that, in fact, the whole um, a process of what it means uh, for the productions of literatures for people and, for, and to enable them to discover uh, who we are is simply no longer seen as universities playing that central function. By the way, uh, if you haven't found Mary Ann Robinson's Gilead yet, give it to yourself for Christmas. Mary, Mary Lynn Robinson is one of the great novels of our time, only having written one of the novels, Housekeeping. But Gilead is absolutely, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's the first Barkian novel. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's, it's remarkable. Um, but uh, uh, what I have to say about the university is all in, in response to the fact that I do have an audience. I do have an audience. They're called Christians. Um, and I have written to that audience assuming that there is just enough language or better speech left that I can count on them recognizing that this is something they can get. Um, so in terms of the ways that I, I, um, I know that um, my writing is uh, haphazard in terms of the various genres in which it's done. But I've always tried to put those collections of essays that I pretentiously call books um, uh, together in a way that you may not get, you may not get um, uh, an essay like um, Why Medicine Needs the Church. But when you read an essay that's written excessively for people who have mentally handicapped children, they can be pulled back to that essay in the hopes that in rereading it, it will begin to make more sense. And hopefully the essays finally add up to being uh, uh, more than the sum of their parts. In particular, one of the things I've always tried to do was leave to trust my reader and leave much 
discretion for the leader, uh, for the reader to make connections. And I'll make a couple just to show you what I'm thinking about. For example, in a book called Sanctify Them in the Truth, there's an essay called Time for Friends Living with a Handicap that is about John Vanier uh, and the, the large group and what he has to tell us about uh, what it means to be with a mentally handicapped and the patience and time that, you, that must be taken to be with the mental, mentally handicapped. Um, um, patience, therefore, becomes one of the major themes I have for explicating what time is about. And a better hope, a collection of essays following Sanctified Men the Truth. There's an essay I did uh, wickedly um, uh, here um, uh, that was a flesh script article for Rao and Greer simply called Enduring. And in the essay called Enduring, I, uh, by using Rowan's um, account of Paulina's Capella, um, uh, I tried to suggest how Rowan's calling brought forth a figure like Paulinus, who was a Christian um, in a public office trying to survive um, in an empire now racked by barbarians, that enduring is really about directing attention back to timeful friends. Namely, um, uh, Christians believe that we have all the time in the world in a world that may well be falling apart to have people like Molinas of Pella to take the time to provide the kind of care necessary that the mentally handicapped do, are not killed in the name of a better society. And then I want to ask, I mean, partly that strategy is to respond without responding to the notion that I'm a sectarian, pediatric tribalist. Because it's a way of trying to show that what I'm, about, what I'm about is changing what you mean by politics. Uh, and um, how um, La Arche residency may be the profoundest indication of what makes a society good just to the extent that it is in existence. Now, as I say, I'm always thinking about those kinds of connections without necessarily drawing them out, but rather trying to teach a different way to think primarily about politics in order for my reader to become part of the project. It's very important, it seems to me, not to make connections, because your reader will even make connections that you yourself didn't know were there, and in the process become um, 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 perhaps better at what you're trying to do than what you're doing. So I always try to write um, in that way, and to help readers, for example, appreciate why um, patience is such an extraordinary political alternative to the speed that dominates political life today. Um, I hope Jeff Stout is happy. I haven't used the word liberal yet. Um, uh, 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 you know, Jeff told me I couldn't use the word liberal anymore. Um, um, so I, I, but another word for speed is liberalism. Now, <laughs> now, I hope what happens is people, myself included, Christians and non-Christians, recognize themselves in such connections. Not just recognize themselves, but are drawn into the thinking with me and against me so that we can all learn to do it better. Um, uh, and in good company, I have some paragraphs about that um, uh, my work obviously uh, defies perfection. <laughs> and I think perfection is, in trying to develop text, is the attempt to kill community. 
um, because once you get perfection, then what do you do with it but admire it and forget it? So exactly, I want my work not to be perfect in that way, but rather to be an invitation. If, if you think it's wrong, do it better. <laughs> and uh, that, and so it's exactly that way that I try to create readers. Because from the very beginning, I realized, I, thought, I think I realized that one of the things we had to do in theology today is create readers. I knew I didn't have Kierkegaard's gifts, but I knew also that something like what Kierkegaard was about in terms of training readers to the pseudonymous literature was something we all had to think about as theologians. And so um, the occasionalistic nature of much of what I do um, is designed um, uh, to entice people into that project. In short, I try not so much to engage or shape public conversations. Rather, I try to change the conversations by reframing how we need to think if Christians are to make contributions in the world in which we find ourselves. So it is finally, it seems to me, insofar as I have any um, account of why I at least have some public notoriety. I think it's finally about the imagination and the, and the examples necessary to give material specification to the imagination. Such examples are our only hope against fantasy and sentimentality, both of which I take to be the great enemies. Fantasies like the only way to ensure peace is through war. That's a fantasy. So I hope the reason why I'm red is because I'm unrelentingly realistic. <laughs> and I try to tell us exactly where we are. And we've got a hell of a lot to hope in because God has given us such an extraordinary gift that gives people, ourselves most importantly, hope in a world without hope. That's the best I can do to say why I like the way I do. Thank you. Uh, I have um, I have 
Uh, for example, one of my close friends at Duke is a man named Ramon Coles, and he's a political theorist. And um, um, he, um, so many of my students minored with him, and he, um, he finally decided, I'm going to have to read this John Howard Bueller guy. And he did, and he felt, he's an atheist, and he felt absolutely in love with, with John. And he called me up, and he said, Stanley, he said, um, uh, Yoder is terrific. He said, in McIntyre, tradition is a tree trunk, but in, in Yoder, it's a vine, you know, that you prune and keep running back. And I said, well, Ron, you know, finally, it's not tradition, it's Jesus. He said, I know it, I know it. And he said, the best I can do on that is Heidegger's being in time. I said, not nearly good enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, um, uh, um, one, I mean, I think it's such a wonderful thing to be, a, to be a theologian in a modern university because we have to read what they read, but they don't usually have to read what we read. And uh, so, um, uh, because we're in, we're in the slave position. And that's great, uh, which means, um, you know, uh, it's wonderful, the various um, opportunities that gives us. And, uh, and uh, I think that, that this is beginning to, have a, beginning to have an effect. For example, um, um, oh, shit. Um, who wrote Bias of Pluralism and uh, I Am Not Secular? Political theorist at Hopkins. I'm sorry? William Connolly. William Connolly, thank you. Um, uh, Bill was just at Duke, and he was, and he was doing a, um, uh, he's written a book um, uh, on what he calls deep pluralism. And um, um, it's really going to be a terrific book. And of course, Bill, Bill is not a secularist, but he's an atheist. Um, I always ask him, where, um, um, how can they become so certain uh, about any position to be an atheist? Um, uh, uh, but uh, it doesn't face most of them. But I, I think it is a kind of problem. Uh, and um, and Bill was um, doing a um, paper on James's uh, a pluralist universe, trying to bring James as the exemplification of what he wants to say is deep, um, uh, is uh, deep pluralism. And so I asked uh, Bill, um, I said, James clearly thought that a jealous God, and I used the language of jealous God rather than monotheism, since I think monotheism is a mistake, um, uh, that James thought a jealous God um, was incompatible with deep theism, or, or deep pluralism. Do you have a view on that? And Conley said, Jesus, I never thought of it. <laughs> and um, uh, and um, uh, so, he, I mean, he was absolutely engaged with that, with that kind of discussion. So I see, you know, I don't, um, I don't see uh, any difficulty at all talking with an atheist. I also, you know, a, a, a number of years ago, I was giving a, 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 I mean, people always think that I'm some kind of enclosed, um, a retreating species of Christians who can't handle the modern world. I wouldn't mind withdrawing. I want to say that, but there's no place to withdraw to. We're surrounded. Okay. And, um, 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 I mean, uh, Barry sometimes looks pretty good in Kentucky, but he's, uh, he's also still surrounded. But um, um, uh, I was at, uh, uh, at Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas, and I can't remember what lecture I was giving, but when I finished, um, Jay McDonald, who's a student of John Cobb's, had just had it with me, thought I was about the worst thing he'd ever heard, and said, your problem, Howard, was is you don't give us any theory that enables us to talk with the Buddhists. I said, gee, Jay, I'm so sorry. How many do you have here in Conway? And, uh, <laughs> and if you found some, what good would a theory do? Sounds like to me a theory would just, I mean, he was thinking, you know, we need a theory of rights or something like that. I said, I just think you'd go talk to them. I mean, we Christians are just insufferable. We want to talk to people. 
uh, because we have a witness. So why do you need a damn theory? Um, 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 I would, um, um, if I were um, you, I would think it's not the Buddhist I need to talk to, it's the fundamentalists. They're your real other. Very <laughs> Conway. Try to take up that conversation uh, and, see, uh, and see how it will change you and so on. So, you know, I, uh, it depends on who they are. I mean, the major problem that we face, anyone that's around the modern university, is, um, I mean, at Duke, um, it would be nice to find people that were really mad at one time about what Judaism or Christianity had done to them. But I don't find that much anymore. They just don't give a shit. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's never come up. Uh, and uh, so uh, how to recover any sense of discussion about those matters uh, becomes, it, I mean, you have to have something interesting to say. And if, you're, and, and if you think what you have interesting to say is just what they already know, you know, they're not interested in talking to you. So, you know, I mean, I was... I mean, all I can do is give you examples. I was um, walking, um, uh, there's a lovely mathematician at a dude named Mike Reed, and I was walking over to the gym with Mike one day, and Mike said, uh, I just don't, he said, I don't get all this God stuff. He said, all that transcendence language just seems false to me. Now, the mathematician remembered. <laughs> and I said, uh, uh, well, Mike, where did you get the idea that you knew what transcendence was before you knew who God was? And he said, oh, I mean, these are smart people. They understand conceptual moves. And um, um, uh, so, you know, I just think you have to take it on. And you do it, and you do it without, um, um, and you're always ready to be surprised about what you're going to find when uh, these kinds of conversations occur. I mean, I, um, I, think, um, I think the idea that somehow or the other, in order for us to be in the public, uh, we need some third language. You see, as far as I, uh, you know, as Christians, you know, all, look, all that third language bullshit is, is, um, is what you get at Harvard by Ron Thiemann, who graduated from here and should know that, thinking, thinking, thinking that Christians are still in control, and so we need to have a third language where we can all get along because we're still in control, and the Muslims and the Buddhists and the atheists aren't. Look, we lost. <laughs> Christianity lost. Isn't that terrific? We're free. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, we don't have to have theories about pluralism anymore. Hell, we just got to get in there and mix it up. Um, it, I mean, why should uh, uh, we're free? And um, uh, of course, you try to be responsible within that. Uh, but uh, you know, um, I mean, it's very. When I was at I, I know, when I was at the University of Notre Dame, I believed all that crap they told us about Catholicism. And, um, and I thought, you know, Notre Dame wanted to be a Catholic school. Um, which, of course, I got in trouble trying to help them be that, and they didn't have any intention to do that. And, um, uh, I, uh, uh, and so um, it's been a great pleasure to be at Duke, where at, at Notre Dame I was seduced into thinking I'm in the center of the university. At Duke, no illusion. <laughs> But um, and that that lets you that lets you um, be free and you can really mix it up out there. So you know, I'm, um, you just do it one at a time. Before I moved to to New Haven in June, if I thought about religion and Yale, I thought of William Sloan Corbett. My question is, was he associated with Divinity School? And during that, during the time we were here, Is anybody uh, or when I was here, yeah, no, he he was he was the uh, he was a head of the Tell Chapel, and uh, and all of us as Divinity School students during that time went down to hear him preach, 
because he represented, I mean, you've got to remember, most of us are accidental Christians who got made that way in the 60s because we thought Christianity was really interesting. And William Sloan caught and represented some of that interest. We quickly, at least some of us who were reading Bart, quickly became quite critical of William Sloan caught. But he was an extraordinary presence, still is an extraordinary presence. And I always thought Reverend Coffin's prayers were absolutely stunning. I mean, as, you know, I was a typical head job. I came to Yale Divinity School trying to, I was only, I wasn't interested in becoming a minister or anything like that. I was just trying to find out if this shit was true. So I only, it never occurred to me that that had anything to do with prayer. And we only went to chapel to find out what our professors might be thinking. So Coffin represented a genuine religious presence that was quite striking to some of us and kind of took us back. I just, I heard one, well, there was a recent biography written on Coffin. And I heard a talk by the author at the Jewish chapel. Yeah, I think, I think the whole, the civil rights and the movement and the anti-Vietnam movement during those years left a very distinct stamp on many of us. Which, in some ways, that was the background for the criticisms of leaving some of Ryan O'Neill behind. And, but also for really having a sense of engaged Christianity. I mean, I always find it, I always find it odd that people think I'm asking Christians to withdraw and so on. Because I think I'm asking Christians to be engaged. Otherwise, why in the hell do people spend so much time attacking me? You know, I just want, I just want Christians out there as Christians. I don't want, you know, so it's not like I'm asking you to get out of anything. I just want you out there as a Christian. Other questions? Can you distinguish between being a Christian and wanting to be a Christian? And I wonder if you could elaborate on that distinction, or if you want to take it in a more personal direction. Why do you put yourself in the latter of the two camps? Oh, because I'm such, I live such a shitty life. I'm a full professor at a major university. I make a lot of money. I don't know what to do with it, particularly. But I don't distinguish between being a Christian and why you should be a Christian. I think that's a very dangerous distinction. People often ask me something like, well, how do you know Jesus was raised from the dead? And that's always an invitation to say, well, I've got to know something more determinative than Jesus being raised from the dead. To know that Jesus was raised from the dead, in order to have some certitude about Jesus being raised from the dead. That's always theologically a reductionistic move. So one of the things I do is always try to defeat a question for something deeper by making it, by showing connections with other things we believe. And so I'm always trying to resist explanation. That's the reason why, I mean, one of the things, one of the things I so enjoy doing is preaching. Though I'm not ordained, so I can only do it under appropriate control. But I have to ask my rector every time, and I do this. And one of the things I enjoy about preaching is it's an ongoing discipline to never get behind the text. 
And I want the supplements never to explain in that way. So I just try to depict it. There was a question here. They all were. Okay. Given your stated disdain for sentimentalism, what dimensions of orthodoxy are worth protecting, and how can they be differentiated from fundamentalism? And the sub-point would be, how do you define, what's your working definition of fundamentalism? Well, I wrote a book that many people really dislike called Unleashing the Scripture, Freeing the Bible from Captivity to America, in which I argued that historical criticism and fundamentalism are just two sides of the same coin. They're both, George Lindbeck is going to get all over me for this, we've had it before, but I still think there's something to this, that fundamentalism and historical criticism are both the result of the Protestant heresy of sola scriptura. You may be able to give it an ecclesial development. They're both the result of the heresy of sola scriptura, which was turned into sola text through the invention of the printing press, which was then given ideological formation through the invention of something called the democratic citizen that thinks they can read scripture without moral guidance and spiritual formation. So now the American people are so corrupt, the only thing we can do is to take the Bible away from them. So they do not get to read it straight up in that way, because they need to be taught how to read it. And so I regard fundamentalism as the kind of bizarre result you get in a kind within modernist hermeneutics that creates something called objectivity. And orthodoxy, I think, I mean, you know, there are many different orthodoxies. I went to Yale. But I think that it's, I have, I am deeply Yale educated in the sense that I think that whatever I'm doing theologically, it is never my theology, but that I am serving the confessions of the church, which also, of course, involves scripture. So it's never me becoming original. So I always stand under the authority of the ongoing tradition. But, of course, then people wonder about that. Bert Bonavent recently wrote a terrific review of the How I Was Reader in Modern Theology. And Bert, who was at Duke for a year and knows a little of my habits, described me as an enthusiastic but eclectic churchgoer. That's certainly true. What can I tell you? You know, I've been driven out of Methodism by the church growth movement. And so after years of telling nasty jokes about Anglicans, that's where I've ended up. So, you know, I say when Paul and I went to the Church of the Holy Family, I worried about them because I knew Holy Family was a Catholic name. But as soon as they called the basement the undercroft, I knew they were Anglicans. There was no potential to go unused. I think my question piggybacks on that one. You use the label Christian a lot. And you use Jesus a lot. Let me tell about the reading of a passage from a book that I know you know about, Greg Jones and Stephen Fowles' book on interpreting scripture. I'm not sure the title of the book. Reading and Communion. Reading and Communion, right. At one point they told a story about this woman is lost in the woods of the Rocky Mountains. She comes upon it for hours and hours, and it's getting dark, and it's terrible. She's threatened with her wolf howls, and you know, all this. She's afraid. She sees a cabin over in the woods. She goes over, she sees a light. She knocks on the door, fearful. Who knows who's behind that door? And the first, a couple open the door, and the first thing they say is, don't be afraid, we're Christians. Now, that sent a chill 
up and down my spine when I read that. Greg and Stephen were telling that story intending to make a comforting point that identity as a member of this community <coughs> should give us one peace. I read it as the beginning of a slasher film. <laughs> and I don't know that's because I'm a gay man and, and people who readily t tell me first thing out of back in the supermarket that they're Christians are usually the people I don't want to have anything to do with. Right. And I guess what I'm trying to press you on is so much of your career has been, in my view, hijacked by the Christian right. And what you say is not like me who wants to stay, in the, actually, I'm, I'm not so sure I would call myself a Christian sometimes when people ask me, but I definitely would call myself an Episcopalian. So I also <laughs> have, have some connection. Browning's <laughs> <laughs> Brown wonderful line in Broken Lives, Mended Lies, I'm a Christian at least as much as an Anglican can have. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then especially after the last few years when it seems like religious fundamentalism of several different kinds are the great enemy for me. Right. I'm wary of tossing around the label Christian so easily. Right. And I guess I want to hear you talk more about how the enemy 40 years ago may have been secularism. I'm not sure that's the enemy right now. Um, Gavin, I just had a thought for a I talk longer. Oh, okay. I do. <laughs> The, um, first of all, if I am having an influence in the religious right, someone tell me about it. <laughs> I want to have an influence in the religious right. I'd like to make them all nonviolent. Um, I mean, if reading me would make them think seriously, uh, Christian nonviolence, great. Um, 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 you know, um, I, so if, I mean, I think that's the reason why uh, I was talking with Strain earlier. I, I think that's the reason why John Howard Yoder's the politics of Jesus drives them crazy. John, John out narrates them on Jesus. And they don't know what to do about that other than just leave it behind. And, and say, oh no, he's got this funny, you know, um, uh, uh, views about non-binaries. But he's pretty good about Jesus. They, um, um, so I, um, the enemy, I wish I could remember the. Why don't you say right at the beginning, uh, Daniel? You toss around the terms Christian oh, a lot and Jesus a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I assume that those are always um, 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 gestures of vulnerability. Uh, that you get to tell me in what ways you think I'm getting it wrong. Um, and uh, so it is never. Um, uh, and oh, I know what I was going to say. Uh, I remember. Um, there's this wonderful report by Drury uh, about he and Wittgenstein passing this street preacher in London. And Wittgenstein made the comment if he really believed what he was saying, he would not use that tone of voice. <laughs> Now, I, I think that's an extraordinarily astute comment about the tone of voice that we say Christian and Jesus with. Um, and that, um, too, I think that um, too much of the use of Christian and Jesus uh, among Christians today has a desperateness to it that um, uh, betrays how you want to use the language. Because it's a club. It's a club of protection. And when you say you're a Christian or you want to follow Jesus, um, quite the contrary. It's not a club. It's the necessity to open one's life to be tested by other Christians. I mean, my, I mean, I think, I think one of the things we need to say, and we need to say it often, is, I mean, I have no doubt that George Bush is a sincere Christian. It just shows how little sincerity has to do with being a Christian. Um, uh, and uh, 
what people at Yale Divinity School need to start saying is George Bush may be a sincere Christian, but he's a pathetic one. Um, uh, because the Christianity that constitutes his, his understanding of what, it's, what it means for him to be a Christian is just pietistic bullshit. And uh, we, need to call, we need to call that the task. Um, uh, and I think that we're not very good at it. Um, 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 because, you know, we're going to make somebody mad or something like that. Um, I've been saying that every chance I get in public because I want to delegitimate George Bush. Not that I've got much power to do that. But indeed, I do think, I do think that the current, the last election, um, 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 was a symbolic seizure of, of, by the religious right of Orthodox Christianity. And that is a judgment on us, that we're letting them get away with it. We ought to say, you know, the problem, I mean, the problem with them, I mean, is that they think they have a relationship with God which they don't find expressed in the church, maybe. They don't have a clue that without the church there's no salvation. So exactly their account of Christianity never makes them vulnerable to communal discipline. Um, um, uh, and they want to name the terms of that communal discipline, namely, you know, sex or uh, cursing or something. So it, it, how, how to help them understand that they're not really very good Christians. We need to say that. You guys are not very good Christians. And we're like, oh, well, that sounds so arrogant. You're damn right it's arrogant. Um, uh, uh, you can't be arrogant enough to that on this kind of stuff. And so, I, I mean, that's, that's how I would respond. I do think, I mean, I, I, I never, when I began, I didn't think the sector was the enemy. It, I mean, that thought never crossed my mind. I thought what was the enemy, and, um, a lot, and I, you know, I think that Jeff, um, Jeff's book, Democracy and Tradition, I think is a terrific book, and I commend everyone to read it, uh, because Jeff is giving us, uh, Jeff Stout, is giving us a great gift, because here is um, a, a thinker who does not identify with Christianity taking theology seriously. That's a great gift. Uh, he, I mean, he's left Rawls and Rorty behind. He, he's, uh, he's ready for us to mix it up um, with strong convictions. That's great. Um, uh, I mean, I, I do find it, I do find it absolutely uh, funny that he thinks that I have convinced a generation of Christians to give up on democracy. I mean, a theologian having that kind of power over Christians, he's got to be crazy. The, uh, uh, but um, uh, what, I, uh, what I do um, uh, think about that is that um, we've got to reclaim our, just as Jeff is now saying, look, there's nothing preventing you from speaking. We've got to speak in a way from our life that can make a contribution to the wider society. And part of that involves a strong critique of the other Christianities are in the world. I, I, I thought of this originally, by the way, when I wrote an essay on, uh, on uh, the People's Temple, Jones's. Uh, and what was so interesting about, I mean, Jones was going increasingly funky, uh, but when he was in L.A. originally at the People's Temple, no one criticized that form of Christianity from the mainstream because he was doing so much good among the poor. Um, uh, uh, and it resulted in um, the deaths in Guam. He should, I mean, where were mainstream Protestants and Catholics saying that kind of Christianity is wrong? Uh, we need to start doing this. Um, and, um, and doing it with, um, with authority. You say, well, where does that authority come from? Yale Divinity School. Um, 
<laughs> so, and I, I am a little, but I am a little worried, uh, Dale, about. I, I just don't know how powerful the religious right is. I just don't have a sense of that, and I don't want. I don't want to make them more. Uh, more powerful than they are. Um, 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 I mean, look, but we, we can be confident. What will destroy the religious right is money, <laughs> just like it destroyed us. I, I mean, being being wealthy, being Christian is probably a contradiction in terms. And um, so, uh, the um, uh, I think the religious right are really into money. And so you can trust their kids uh, to become the same kind of um, uh, um, uh, consumers that our kids are. Uh, so, you know, I, I give them 20 years and uh, see if they can reproduce themselves. <laughs> Wes had his hand up, and this will be the last question. If you want to take up the last uh, I, I'm still sort of stuck in your comment in response to parents of handicapped children. You don't understand why. Um, yeah, sure. In your discussion with patients and in response to them. And I want to sort of ask you to sort of talk more about patients in the context of theological education. What does this patient look like, feel like, sound like in the context of theological education? Boy, that's a good question. I have to get up every damn morning and do it again. <laughs> I um, um, uh, it means that in a world as unjust as this, when people are dying of starvation at this moment, when cruelty exists that is unimaginable. We think we can take the time to read books in the hope that reading those books well will make us a people capable of standing against the hunger and the cruelty that exists. Whether, whether, how to do that without it becoming ideology and false consciousness. There's no way, there's no guarantee to avoid that other than having people call us to account. Um, um, so we believe that ministerial leadership of congregations is part of God's salvation of the world. I can't imagine a deeper metaphysical draft on the way things are. But I think it, that's what the Ao Divinity School is about. It's what Duke Divinity School is about. And God may judge us harshly for being less than his people um, as we go about that work. So it seems to me that one of the most important things we can do is as students and teachers alike recognize that this stuff matters. This stuff matters. And that means we've got to resist the academic culture that always wants us to take an off Gehoven against this or that person. Uh, and how to recover a sense of what we're about as genuine service to real people. I think is part of our great challenge. Um, and again, that has to do with audience. 
it is, I mean, it is so wonderful that I know there are people out there called Christians to who I write. You know, I mean, that's wonderful. And I owe them the best job I can to try to help them name some of what I'm doing as important to their lives, just like it's in our teaching and training people for the ministry, that the congregations will say, Amen, send us more of people who care so deeply about us They think this is about salvation. So I guess that's the only answer I can really give.